Today, if you live in a big western city, the winter has practically no effect on your life in any significant way. Things like certain foods, which can only be grown in warm conditions, can easily, for the most part, be imported from across the world when necessary. And thanks to the power of central heating, just because it's cold outside doesn't mean you have to be cold inside. Well, unless you live in times of war where such global food and energy supply chains become affected, but I digress. We like to think the winter affects us majorly because of things like potential higher utility bills, transport delays, or recreational availabilities. And yes, these things certainly aren't ideal, but for the most part, we live. But this wasn't always the case, for in the past, the winter used to be something that was treated with absolute severity as a matter of survival. In pre-industrial times, it's estimated that around 90% of the population was engaged in some form of agricultural activity. As back then, there was no hex mart you could just walk into to get your food, stocked by well-connected and established global supply chains. Most of the time, if you wanted food, you had to grow your own, making the winter an immensely challenging time. For if you didn't have a bountiful harvest beforehand, then you were essentially doomed, as the combination of colder temperatures and shorter daylight hours made it much more difficult to grow crops. And there was no fancy central heating systems to keep you warm when indoors either. All you would have had is a trusty fireplace, of which, due to the shoddy construction of most shelters back then, would have barely done its job regardless, leading to much higher levels of disease and sickness especially amongst the young and elderly. Thus, every autumn, as the leaves of the trees started to fall, revealing a withered husk primed for the winter, people too started to think during this time on the nature of mortality. It's documented that in ancient times, the Celtic people of the British Isles celebrated numerous events that marked the end of the autumn and the beginning of the winter. Such as Samhain in what is today Ireland and Scotland, a Alantide in what is today Cornwall in England, and Nos Galan Gaeth in what is today known as Wales. All of which, despite their regional differences, had a similar underlying theme, honouring and reflecting on the dead. It was believed that during this period of seasonal transition, that the boundary between the world of the living and the world of the dead was thinner, allowing spirits to cross over into reality for better or worse. A belief that originated in Celtic paganism. And while the exact rituals of such events aren't well known, it is believed that people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off any potential evil spirits. It is also believed that people would make offerings in order to honour any potential good spirits and seek their protection for the winter to come. In addition, it's also believed people thought it was much easier for druids to tap into the spiritual realm in order to make predictions for the future, which for a very superstitious and spiritual people would have been taken very seriously. As time passed, however, Christianity would eventually start to become dominant within such pagan lands, and with it, the practices that occurred within them would also start to shift. The Catholic Church had an event known as All Saints Day, made to celebrate and revere the lives of saints. While the event originally took place in May, it was eventually moved to the 1st of November. The reason why is up for debate, but is believed by some to be an attempt to replace pagan festivals such as Samhain with Christian ones of a similar nature. And while pagan beliefs would eventually be superseded by Christian beliefs, the many pagan elements of such events, such as bonfires, costumes and offerings, would nevertheless remain and continue to be celebrated on October the 31st, eventually culminating in the event we today refer to as Halloween. All in all meaning that Halloween is a, no pun intended, Frankenstein's monster of an event that originated via long forgotten pagan beliefs which were subsequently replaced by Christian alternatives. 
resulting today in a sort of spiritually empty celebration. In the past, I made a production about how I believe consumerism is killing Christmas, turning it from a celebration of the birthday of Jesus Christ into a day where people essentially just open gifts and get drunk with family. This transformation of what was a serious religious event into an unserious secular one I found particularly irking, and Halloween shares a similar logic in this regard. Of course, I'm not here to be a party pooper. I actually find the festivities of Halloween to be extremely enjoyable. However, seeing how few people actually understand the underlying spiritual significance of how such an event came to be, while completely embracing its leftover spook-themed consumerism, in my view, really does summarise the state of the modern Westerner very succinctly. We love the bread and circus, the material distractions of an often comedic nature, turning the intangible into the tangible. But when it comes to actually pondering the nature of death, legacy, and the afterlife, we won't dare to even begin. The spiritual realm, what is beyond our immediate understanding, has become beyond us. And while on this topic, I actually have somewhat of a Halloween-themed story that proves such a point very well. The 12th of September 2023, 9.30am. What was a forgettable time for most people was host to one of the most unusual experiences I have ever had in my life. I was asleep, and it was one of those deep sleeps whereby you have many dreams that you just can't remember. I do, however, remember one, the last one, of which is perhaps better described as a brief nightmare. I was walking in my hallway when I saw a black cat in the other end of the hall. I went up to the cat, likely out of curiosity, when all of a sudden it started screeching and attacking me. As soon as it pounced on me, I woke up in reality. But I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe, and stood on my carpet by the side of my bed was what I can only describe as another cat that looked extremely alien. Almost like a pillow, robotic, Egyptian, mostly white, but light green in some places, with these giant, soulless, black, beady eyes, with no pupils. No visual representation I can show you could possibly match how creepy it looked like, and I'm not exactly the greatest artist. But nevertheless, it radiated a menacing aura, as if it was responsible for my paralysis and lack of breath, and wanted me to know about it. Freaking out, I quickly hatched a plan. I was going to conserve as much energy as I possibly could into freeing my hand, and then punch it. And that's exactly what I did. I screamed, clenching my fist, and punched the entity with an immense effort. But it didn't land on anything. After punching, the rest of my body became free, and I started frantically scanning the room for the entity. But alas, it was nowhere to be seen. And then, like clockwork, I heard my watch alarm go off, just as set, for 9.30am. The fact that the watch went off just seconds after I got up felt even more sinister, almost as if it was a calculated message sent to me by some malicious force beyond my comprehension. The following is a snippet of a voice message I sent to someone I know right after this occurred, where you can tell I'm still somewhat flustered. You know, I'm not one to... You know, I don't know, I've never had an experience like that before. I obviously started researching just what on earth had happened to me. As a religious man, one part of me thought I had just had some sort of real-life demonic encounter, whereas the more rational side started to conclude perhaps I was getting some sort of early-onset schizophrenia. After all, I had never had any such hallucinations before in my life. Fortunately, after some brief research on the net, it seemed this may not be the case, and that on the contrary, such encounters are actually quite a well-documented phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. The following is some snippets I received from other people's experiences with such phenomena. I once saw a cat-sized shadow creature at the base of my bed, and it slowly crawled up to my sheets and finally up to my chest. It made me feel very, very uncomfortable. One of the most spookiest experiences I've ever had in my life. 
I had the sudden urge to wake up one night, and as much as I tried to open my eyes, I couldn't. Couldn't move my body, and could only get my eyes open for about a split second. Each time I opened them, I could see a figure getting closer and closer to my bed, until I think I woke myself up out of fear, as I don't remember what happened after it got around two feet away from me. I've never had any visual encounters, but one time when I was laying on my left side, I started to feel pressure on my chest. I realised then that I was paralysed and started panicking. Then something whispered in my ear, just coming in to say goodnight. That's when I felt like something was pushing me towards the edge of my bed. It was terrifying. While I was grateful and somewhat relieved to see that other people had also had similar experiences, I actually ended up getting annoyed from such research, as while those who had had such experiences certainly took it most seriously, those who hadn't, more often than not, seemed not bothered by such, merely dismissing it as if it's nothing, trying to make some sort of joke out of it, or accusing people of writing creepy pastas. But this isn't nothing, it isn't a joke, and it definitely isn't creepy pastas. This is a very disturbing experience that feels very otherworldly. The oddest thing about sleep paralysis is that there's no concrete understanding of why people even experience it. Of course, there are theories, such as malfunctions in the sleep process, but nothing absolute. And so it's amazing to me how the general public isn't obsessed about such a phenomenon. It's the same feeling of frustration I get when I try and tell people about DMT or ayahuasca psychedelic realms and entities. That same disgusting response of automatic comedic rejection, as if this isn't even something that's worth discussing. I suppose in a world of facts and logic, anything that even slightly deviates away from reason and cannot concretely be explained is simply buried away. Proving the point that the modern Western man today is, on average, completely spiritually disconnected. But it wasn't always like this. There's art from hundreds of years ago that is said to represent sleep paralysis, such as the 1781 painting The Nightmare, which shows some sort of demonic entity mocking a paralysed woman. And seeing art like this got me thinking, wow. If I, in the modern world, with access to borderline unlimited information at my fingertips, remain shocked by my sleep paralysis experience, imagine what our ancestors must have been like after they had theirs. They wouldn't have been able to read thousands of stories from strangers across the globe about their similar experiences. They wouldn't have had access to any potential practical theories on why it happens. They genuinely would have believed it was some sort of ghost or demon which could explain why pagan events such as Samhain even existed in the first place. It's not because our ancestors were stupid, as if some bard of the time wrote a story and everyone just went along with it. It was a collective attempt to rationalise that of which was beyond rational understanding, and that today we live in their shadow, celebrating their festivities, but can't remember why, nor care, what they were even really about. Like a form of collective dementia, it's not just a matter of spiritual ignorance, but a form of historical ignorance. We simply no longer care about the past, our past, because our history is one of mysticism. And when you reject such entirely, you also unknowingly reject the building blocks that made the society that you live in. And this is something that only the remaining religious people in the West actually seem to understand. While writing this, I got in a conversation with a Catholic lady I know, who agreed with my conclusion on such modern ignorance. She reminded me that it's the reason why after Halloween, All Saints Day exists, to honour the fallen greats long gone by. But she also told me of another celebration that takes place right after it, All Souls Day, with the idea being to honour not just the greatest of the fallen, but all of the fallen. According to her, many Catholics don't just believe in a heaven or hell, but also a middle ground realm known as purgatory, where those who have died mostly in a state of good morals, but still have unfinished business on earth, temporarily remain, before they can finally ascend upwards to heaven. Such Catholics believe that masses, prayers and acts of charity on behalf of such souls in purgatory can help to expedite their process. 
with All Souls Day being the primary time of such assistance. And this doctrine actually reminded me of an old story I was told. A woman I know once had a boyfriend who left the world too early due to numerous mental health issues. After much mourning, around a decade later, she would go with another man and have a son with him. According to her, when her son first started talking, he mentioned the name of the ex-boyfriend and told her that he said hello. To which she turned utterly distraught. The Catholic lady believed such a story was a prime example of a soul in purgatory, likely feeling guilty for the way he left the world and the state he left her in. Fascinated by this, she decided to pray for the man in the hopes that his ascension would be accelerated assuming it wasn't already complete. Now, did I really believe in the concept of purgatory, or this poor gentleman being stuck within it? No. But I nevertheless admired the way such Catholics honoured the dead, and reflected heavily on their lives. It likewise reminded me of the Mexican festival known as the Day of the Dead, that merges merry festivities with reflecting on those long past. As such reflections are something that is heavily missing from the mainstream today, much to our own shame. There's a metaphor I have called the Torch of Civilization, and the idea is really quite simple. Civilization is represented by a torch, because that's really what such order is. A light in the vast darkness of the universe that guides us down a greater path of understanding. Every generation, for a time, holds the Torch of Civilization whereby they are in charge of every institution of society, caring for the old that made them, and the young that they made themselves. Eventually, however, such a leading generation becomes old, where they then pass the torch onwards to their descendants. And this cycle repeats, ad infinitum, forever. But the problem with the modern Westerner is that they have dropped the torch of civilization. They don't care for what came before them, and they certainly don't care about leaving anything behind after them. They merely just frolic in the ever-decreasing sparks of the torch they've dropped, leaving others to pick up the torch in their place. And I can't stress just how abnormal this is, not just in society, but even in nature. I've watched a lot of documentaries about birds, how they pick a nest to breed in, whereby the mothers protect their eggs for months, while the fathers hunt for food. And it always amazes me how such birds have these desires relentlessly ingrained in their very programming. So much hardship, suffering, and effort, just to survive and reproduce. And it hit me that, of course, it's not just birds who are like this, but all forms of life, including us humans. But as we've become so disconnected from our primal nature, our desire to survive the harsh tragedies of life, just as our farming, agricultural ancestors did, we've actually somehow started to abandon not just our spirituality, not just our history, but what it even means to be a human being. We have unintentionally become parasites, taking for granted the hardships of our ancestors while spitting on their long-forgotten corpses. Logic that radiates throughout almost every aspect of modern Western society. Look at much of the rest of the world outside of the West. They cherish their ancestors and the struggles they went through. We, however, despite being the greatest civilization that mankind has ever known, today don't even give ours the time of day. On the contrary, we would rather pretend that they never even existed. How shameful, truly. And Halloween really is a bitter reminder of such, unlike anything else, as, unfortunately, this event has become somewhat of an unintentional mockery, whereby rather than reflecting on the struggles of those who came before us, we instead exclusively take an embrace of empty pleasure. I know it sounds heavy and somewhat dramatic, but it really is one of those things where you either get it or you don't. And I know that the vast majority of people today don't have a clue. But hopefully, dear viewer, you do, as it really doesn't have to be this way. And so every year when Halloween rolls around, be sure to enjoy your sweets, your pumpkins, your costumes, and the usual symbols of festivity. 
but also be sure to take some time to reflect on who toiled for you to enjoy those things in the first place. Those who came before you. It's not about being hedonistic, but it's also not about being depressive. It's about being in the middle ground, the purgatory between the world of the living and the world of the dead. For that, ladies and gentlemen, is the true meaning of Halloween. <laughs>